Yes, we okay. are recording. All right, so for the benefit of the video, uh, I'll repeat the story I just gave. Um, why am I covered in sweat? I went for a run this morning. Yes, I did take a shower. <laughs> but after taking that, I managed to get myself lost. So I apologize for being uh, slightly drenched. Um, anyway, my name is John Masters. Um, this is going to be a talk on, well, two things. So, my role in Red Hat is predominantly focused um, on Red Hat products. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what that means in the ARM context in a few moments. Uh, but what I wanted to do today was to kind of give you guys a general update on some of the super secret stuff Red Hat's been doing, some of the cool stuff that's coming in the ARM ecosystem, um, ARM servers. You know, Red Hat's an enterprise server company. There might be a connection. Uh, and then how do, we, how do we leverage, right? So it's all great that Red Hat's doing stuff. That's great. This is the Fedora conference. So what am I really getting to? The point I'm getting to is, if Red Hat cares about something from a commercial point of view, how do we leverage that in the Fedora space to make sure that Fedora is the gold standard for ARM servers upstream? We have a unique opportunity right now, I'm going to come on to in a few moments, uh, to kind of abuse <laughs> the situation that Red Hat cares about this uh, new ecosystem or new space uh, and exploit that to ensure that, that ARM is both the first class citizen in the Fedora context, uh, but also that we become the gold standard for uh, people experimenting with ARM servers who don't want to go and buy an enterprise OS or something like this. So my uh, email address is, uh, is on there. Uh, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, so, that's what I want to cover today. Really four things. First one is a little bit about what ARM is and what it means. Uh, the second one is kind of the difference between embedded ARM that you might have seen uh, so far, in particular with 32-bit ARM devices, um, Panda boards, WAND boards, um, anything, um, star.board, uh, starboards.org, uh, right? Um, or if you're in the US, asterisk um, uh, So what's the difference between that and some of the server systems that we are going to be seeing increasingly over the next few years? Um, what have we been up to for the last three or four years uh, in this space? Good morning. You're yeah. What's that? Yeah. 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 Three, four, six. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we all knew. We, we, uh, we were off by one. So, uh, so I can heckle. Yes, you can heckle. Um, so, okay. So we'll let these jokers sit down. <laughs> I resemble that remark. Security? Yeah, right. Okay, so, so before you interrupt, um, we're covering four things today in the main, and it all gets to how do we abuse Red Hat's position carrying about ARM servers to make Fedora really awesome on server systems. So I'm going to cover, cover what Red Hat's been up to, um, and then I want to have a discussion about how we abuse that and leverage that position uh, for maximum gain uh, with Fedora. So what do I do? Uh, I do uh, technical steering within Red Hat. Um, I work with ARM um, and a lot of other companies kind of behind the scenes um, on standardization, work with the ARM architecture team on the architecture itself. We have a lot of conversations about new instructions and things that no one really wants to care about here, right? We have a lot of very, very technical conversations. Um, I co-created the Lenara Enterprise Group with others, um, and LEG is focused on optimizing and solving uh, server problems um, on the ARM architecture. In particular, it is one of the ways in which standards get implemented. And I collaborate with the people that actually do shit. Excuse my language for a moment. Um, so you've got Dennis and you've got Peter here in the front row in particular. There are others. Uh, one of the guys that really helped today, uh, who's not here, uh, is Paul Whalen. Uh, if you're watching, Paul, round of applause to you. Thank you. He's likely asleep. He is right now, but he'll, he'll see the replay, right? Um, so, yeah, so uh, Paul is um, our QE lead. Um, within the, the Red Hat team, um, and he is uh, very focused on helping to ensure that all the various boards that people have today work really well. 
Uh, he works very closely with uh, Peter Robinson in particular. And Peter is one of the guys in the front row here who's actually uh, making Fedora builds happen and has a talk coming up next, so I won't preempt that by covering any more of that. Um, and what I'm trying to do increasingly is pull ARM vendors into Fedora. So uh, a lot of these companies getting into servers, you've probably heard of a couple of them so far. There are many more, and over the next couple of years, there's going to be a lot more companies kind of appearing and saying, hey, we care about ARM servers. We have been talking to them for a while, and we're talking to them right now, and the goal is, as they start to become public and say, hey, we care about telling other people what we're doing, our goal is to pull them into Fedora as quickly as possible and have them engage publicly in a community that cares about doing things upstream and doing things right. There are other communities out there where that's not the emphasis. Um, you know, they don't care about upstream curtains, they don't care about some of these things as much as we do. And we want to make sure that these companies get the right idea and do things right. Hasn't always gone smoothly, but you know, we're working on that. We want to promote the upstream first philosophy that is so effective in Fedora. So, some brief ARM um, nomenclature. Uh, if you guys go on to the Fedora ARM project today, you will hear a lot of talk about ARM version 7. That is the last purely 32-bit ARM architecture. Uh, it has some nice features. It supports SMP. Not the first version to support SMP, but the main one. So you can have more than one processor in your system. Nobody has a single processor phone anymore. Uh, and nobody is going to buy single processor computers within the next few years. Um, it supports things like LPAE, so you can have more than 4 gigabytes of memory, these, these kinds of features, but it's still a 32-bit architecture. ARM version 8 is the first 64-bit uh, ARM architecture. Uh, it includes two different modes. You can run existing 32-bit uh, code uh, on some systems. Not every system will support that. And then you can run purely 64-bit code um, in what's called AR64, when it's running as a 64-bit mode. Um, ARM is a licensable architecture. So what this means uh, is that the phone in your pocket right now, there's a 95% certainty it's got an ARM chip in it, right? Um, multiple. Well, multiple, yes. But, but <laughs> there's only a 5% chance that it doesn't have an ARM chip in it. So this phone has uh, a Qualcomm processor in it, a mobile processor, um, and you know they, they're one of many companies, so Apple and, and others, who license the architecture uh, and can go and do whatever they want, as long as they conform to the architecture and don't break things and pass all the tests. Um, they are free to choose how to make their own ARM processor. So if you are a company with a lot of money, you can go do that. Um, if you have slightly less money or you don't really want to go and try to reinvent the wheel, you can uh, pay ARM to uh, put one of their processor designs into your, um, your processor. This is why you hear things like Cortex A53 and A57. Those are designs made by ARM that uh, processor companies can go and buy and use. And the big difference is, rather than having one company, like Intel or AMD, um, you now have a whole variety of companies that can go and make ARM-compatible processors. Um, now that's great. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the benefits of this and also the downsides. The benefits, of course, are that there are, you know, 95% of all phones out there have an ARM processor in there. Um, 50 billion, with a B, ARM processors have ever been shipped. Um, and last year there were, I think, 13 billion processors shipped. So there's a lot of ARM processors being made. On the, on the average year. There will be many more made, um, and that's tremendous that people can go and do that. Um, the downside, of course, is that because there are so many different implementations of um, the ARM architecture, that can lead to some compatibility issues, um, especially when it comes to server systems um, that my employer is interested in. <coughs> some of the companies in the server context that are building uh, processors and have announced that they are doing so uh, include AMD, um, you know, traditionally an x86 company, they've decided to get into the uh, ARM server business. And they have a processor called Seattle that uh, uh, is, uh, is now available, actually, to, to purchase. Um, Applied Micro, one of the companies that I've been working with for uh, many years now, 
and I have one of their systems right here that I will demo uh, Fedora running on uh, in a few moments. Uh, Cavian, uh, Robert Richter is here from Cavian today, and we will be uh, discussing uh, ways in which Cavian wants to get more engaged in the Fedora community. As an example of one of the companies I mentioned that um, is becoming more public about what they're doing, and now is the right time to reach out and have a conversation and work out how we can collaborate together to make sure that Cavium's processor is a well-supported Fedora. Um, and there are others, Broadcom, they haven't said a lot yet, but they've said a few things. Um, and, um, and many other exciting ones uh, to be named uh, in the future. So, uh, some of the other words that you will hear me mention over the next hour, this is not going to be a, a venting session, I promise. Um, <laughs> But you will hear me mention things like the SPSA, which is uh, what we call the server-based system architecture. Um, a little thing that uh, myself and a couple of others kind of kicked off um, about three years ago, two or three years ago. And we pulled in um, all of the vendors that I've mentioned, and many more, but I haven't. Uh, <coughs> many other operating system vendors, not just the ones that you might instantly think of. And we sat around in committee rooms for a long time and worked <coughs> out how we could build a standard platform. Um, because if we're going to go and you know, get into the server business with ARM, how do we do this right? So what we did was come up with an architecture specification that requires you have certain hardware in your system, things you would expect on a server. Um, we had a talk yesterday that Leo gave. Ah, good morning. See, he had this on screen. That's great. Um, so Leo gave a talk about building a homebrew um, cluster FS cluster using one boards, which he in fact has, this is almost like we tagged this. <laughs> one, <laughs> please, here, there we go. Um, so we talked about the, uh, we talked about Leo's uh, boards yesterday. One thing that was mentioned, somebody in the audience mentioned that uh, with ARM you never know when you're booting it up, uh, what your serial port, what your serial console is going to be called. Is it TTY AMA? Is it TTY S0? Is it something else? That's being fixed. That is being fixed, but I'm giving an example here. Okay. <laughs> so, what we do uh, in the server world is we currently allow vendors to have precisely two choices of compatible UART, and next year it goes to one. So, I like that. I like choice as long as it's one uh, when it comes to certain things, like printing out messages when I boot my system. There's no point in having 20 different ways to do that. So we also provide, uh, we also provide other features you'd expect on servers. There's a standardized watchdog. There are other features that you would expect a server to have in order to be minimally functional. We don't care about forcing people to do anything other than to say, if you want to have a common platform that you can run standard software on, there are certain minimum expectations. You can do anything else beyond that, and people have. They've done some very exciting things, but there's a minimum, and that's what we specify. So, so you don't care about things like IPMI or anything like that? Or? We've discussed management um, and external management, um, and um, there were some OEMs involved in the conversation. And I'll summarize how it went. I said, none of these guys are going to let you standardize that space. That's their bread and butter. That's how they make money. We'll come back to it. <laughs> and uh, I intend to come back to it, but I didn't want them to leave the room the moment we started discussing this. So um, we punted that down the road. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's an evolving set of specifications. So what happens is we have the first release. And over time, we have these levels of compatibility. We have SBSA level 0. We currently have. I believe publicly we've released levels one and two, and there are going to be obviously more that will define more and more standard hardware. That's one more question. How about PCI? Right, so some of the features uh, are covered in a sense, if you implement this, you should do this. So it doesn't say you have to have PCI. Okay. What it does, for example, is say, if you have X, it must be compatible with Y. So you have to have AHCI, for example, and not just you know whatever you feel like doing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, other standards that we care about, UEFI, I'll explain why in a moment, um, but that's what it means. Um, ACPI, and that's what ACPI means. Um, and then some other names you'll hear, U-Boot and Device Tree, um, that I'll talk a bit about in a moment. 
Um, the, the thing I'm getting to really is that there's a difference between this <laughs> and this. <laughs> right? This gets more words. Right. <laughs> this. <laughs> but this. This is more Right. Now, but the difference isn't actually what you think it is. Okay? People, what people look at is they say, okay, that's a Raspberry Pi, and they may or may not like that. Um, and this is a Google Data Center. Uh, and you look at it and you think, okay, these are big shiny servers and, and, and you draw various conclusions about cost and other things. But the big difference between the two is actually not that. The big difference between the two um, is the design philosophy that's used in designing the two. When you're designing an embedded system like the Raspberry Pi, what you care about is cost. That's very important. What you're trying to do is make a low-cost computer. You're trying to make it hackable, um, and you're trying to provide um, interfaces and expandability, um, and you're really trying to be a Swiss Army knife kind of implementation that lets people play around. Okay? You are not trying to build a standard platform. And so if you uh, kind of expose the uh, guts of the system and how it works, um, then that's fine. Right? That, in fact, is encouraged. That's uh, how people build cell phones and all kinds of embedded systems today. Um, and that's great. If you're building one of these, if you're building a server system, there are many different design philosophies that are successful. There are some that are not successful. And I will explain uh, both how people can succeed in building servers and how they cannot succeed in building servers with examples. So I can't really go any further without citing this because everybody who follows me on Google Plus or anything else really for that matter has seen these t-shirts. Um, so I said this one time and people make these, these shirts now and I kind of enjoy it so I, I play up to it. But the thing I'm trying to get to here is look, I only care about this percentage of the ARM ecosystem most of my time. I care about server systems. I don't care what people do with embedded devices, and please do whatever you like. I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do or advocate for anything when it comes to embedded designs at all. Um, and I think in Fedora we're going to have a variety of systems, some that are server and some that are not server. Um, and I think that's great, and to be encouraged and supported um, and all kinds of good things. Um, but when it comes to building server systems, um, I have certain expectations going in that differ from building embedded devices, and I want to advocate for those. So what's an embedded device? Well, an embedded device is really about you know, three major pieces. The first is that it involves integrated software and hardware. Maybe not in the sense of how Fedora ships, but in the sense of how most embedded designs are done. It's a phone and you've designed Android at the same time you designed the hardware, right? That's the classical embedded example. So you weld it together, and you don't really have to be too concerned about portability because you control both the operating system and the hardware at the same time. Um, cost is the major factor. If I come to you and say, I need you to implement standards X, Y, and Z, or Z, um, because I want to build one operating system that works across every embedded device, and it's going to cost you 50 cents more per board to implement that, you're going to say, great, there's the door, have a nice day. <laughs> right? That's how these guys work, because cost is the driving factor, um, and it doesn't really make sense to them to go and build complex hardware that, that isn't necessary. Right? That's why we have sub $100 boards, sub $50 boards, sub $30 boards, or translate that into euros, uh, I guess 20, 20 euros, something like that. Right? Um, and they are very fast <laughs> moving and complex devices. Right? Phones are not simple devices. These are very, very fast moving devices, but they change rapidly too. Um, and if I tell you you have to build it in a certain way or make it compatible with something, um, that might limit your flexibility to go and build a new one every three months. So that might not be a good thing for everyone. Um, embedded devices also provide, generally speaking, they provide a very light amount of what we call firmware or bootloader. So you turn it on and uh, it does a little bit of setup in the hardware. Most of the setup is done in software uh, in Linux. Uh, and Really, each platform has a certain level of gratuitous differentiation. 
Folks like Dennis will, will jump in and say, but I'm standardizing stuff. And they are, and they're working really well in the community to clean up how things operate. But fundamentally, they're not designed with any kind of standard specification going in. So you turn on your embedded device, you boot loads up, and everything's a little bit different. People are trying to collaborate to clean that up. But there's no industry body that says, here's exactly how this has to behave to be compliant. Um, and every time you boot a system, what it's doing is it's relying on Linux to set up a lot of things. It's telling the kernel, here's everything, all the hardware in my device, how it's wired up together, go figure this out and go boot. Um, it's maximally hackable and very customizable, um, but Linux has to have a lot of low-level detailed knowledge about how the hardware is put together, um, and that adds complexity and uh, problems later on. How does that differ for, for servers? Here's a copy of ARM servers. This is a prototype open compute cartridge with uh, an applied microchip on it. Um, you'll start to see a lot of these servers appearing over the coming months. Uh, this is an AMD Seattle development board. Um, you'll start to see a lot more of that stuff appearing over the coming months. Uh, we're collaborating actually with, with AMD. Uh, there'll be more kind of, uh, I guess, stuff coming in that space, but we're looking to effectively ship uh, every Seattle board with a version of Fedora. Uh, and I'm very excited that Fedora 21, with a couple of tweaks that we're hoping to get in in time, uh, should support this out of the box. That's going to be very exciting. Servers. Servers are general <coughs> purpose computing platforms. They are not embedded devices. The, the principal difference between a server and an embedded device is that I'm not expecting, in the traditional sense, to buy my hardware and get my software at the same time. Now, when it comes to Fedora, it's a little bit different historically because you know, people go and buy a <coughs> development board and then they put Fedora on it. Um, but that isn't the reason that that hardware was originally built. The reason that hardware was built was to develop Android, in, in some cases, to support embedded communities. But in most cases, it's de they're developed with the, the notion of supporting Android at the same time. Uh, in servers, you're not welding the two pieces together. They really are independent. And customers and users and community members have certain expectations that have been really successful uh, in the past. That they can go and buy a computer from vendor X and put software from vendor Y on it um, and roughly expect that to work. In order for that portability to happen across hardware, we have to abstract a few things about the platform underneath. So what differs in principle between a server and an embedded device is that we expect the platform to set up a lot of stuff behind the scenes that the operating system will never see. And we expect to have certain interdependencies between hardware components hidden from us. I'll give you an example of this. A lot of the embedded boards you see will have, well, they're all built on what's called a system on chip. So they have an ARM processor, but really it's got everything else on the same chip. It's got network interfaces, it's got SATA interfaces, it's got PCI interfaces, it's got all these things. The way people design these, though, is they get these building blocks called IP blocks. They, uh, they, they lay down an ARM processor, and next to it they put a, a SATA Mac, and they put a network Mac, and they put a PCI block. And then they say, OK, I'm going to have a certain number of physical interfaces on here so people can wire things up. And then I'm going to put this little gunk in the middle that lets me decide flexibly how many PCIs do I have, how many SATAs do I have today, this kind of thing. And in the embedded case, they're going to assume that Linux is going to say, ah, yes, I realize in order to use the network, I have to be aware that I'm sharing that with the solder over here, but only if it's the third day of the week and the moon's over there, and then I can wire it up this way. Um, and that's great, and that's a complex interdependent design um, that can't work for a general purpose platform. So what we do is we either hide that, or we don't design it that way in the first place. Um, the latter is what we're trying to do, but if we can't do that, then we hide it by wiring it up one way before we boot, and we pretend it was never like that to start with. 
That's how it is on PCs today. Your PC that you have uh, is actually very much more complicated, but you never see this setup because it's hidden from you. Um, so we don't have the interdependencies, and we expect the firmware to turn on all of these pieces ahead of time. Some of the embedded systems that we buy today have hundreds of what we call clocks. I don't mean like a wall clock. I mean a, a little signal that comes in and powers all these components. It says, okay, now you can do something, you can do something, you can do something. And you might have hundreds of these. And you, in an embedded device, the kernel has to keep track in the clock framework, that's what it's called, um, tracking, turning on all these clocks and knowing if I want to use my solder interface, I have to turn this thing on and wire it up this way and set this frequency. I might also have to supply this amount of this power source and wire it up this way. No, we don't do that in servers, we hide it. We set it up ahead of time and we don't have to do that at runtime. Everything else uh, in my parlance is what I would call a cute embedded nonsense hack. Um, but the reality is, those are great and wonderful, and I advocate for them, um, just not in servers. Uh, so we have a specification that we've defined, or a series of specifications that we've defined. Um, they provide certain hardware components and then certain software components. So in servers, we mandate the presence of a couple of components. UEFI to boot, which means that when I turn my system on, there is a very needy specification that says, this is exactly how the hardware is going to behave before it boots up. All these different devices are going to be initialized in a certain standard way that we know, because we can go and look it up in a, in a manual uh, specification. And uh, when I boot my system, if I'm booting across the network, that's going to work because it's specified. If I'm booting from a local uh, storage device, I don't have to know exactly which one and where it is because there's an abstraction and a standard specification uh, for doing that. In the case of finding out what hardware I have in my system, uh, we use ACPI 5.1. I'll come, I'll come to your question in a moment. We use ACPI 5.1, uh, which specifies how you discover what devices are present in your system. ACPI intentionally limits hardware design choices. For example, you can't specify complex interdependencies between IP blocks, and if you uh, read the specification, it says you shouldn't design it that way, and I agree. For a server, you shouldn't design it that way. There's no way to express that, and we've intentionally kept it that way. Uh, so what you're trying to do with ACPI is abstract the underlying hardware in the same way that, that has worked so well on server systems in the past. And the important thing is to support many operating system choices. So if we're going to build on servers, we can't just think about Linux. I care about Linux. I'm very, very excited about it. But what I don't want is to have to go get the firmware or the hardware that supports this OS or the firmware or the hardware that supports that OS. I want to go and buy an ARM server and then choose my OS. And if I don't like the OS I have, I want to go and replace it with Linux and put Fedora on my system and not have to worry about, did the vendor give me a firmware that I can even boot Linux on, right? So what we've done is we've worked with other vendors to make sure that it will be a level playing field as far as letting customers choose what they want to run. Okay, so that being said, how should you not build a server? I've seen a few of these, so I thought I'd give you an example. The first thing you should do, if you want to uh, fail, um, is design something that's overly complicated. Okay, uh, don't have it set itself up when you power it on, and um, expose as many of these interdependencies as possible. That would be a really good start. If you can do that, you're probably going <laughs> to fail, but it's not a given. So next, I want you to save money on your board design. Don't put a real-time clock battery on there. That would be really good. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> and don't put any flash on your system that stores things like MAC addresses or any of that stuff, because I really want to wire that into some you know, device tree file I have to load somewhere. That would be optimal, right? If you, if you start putting these devices on there, you might make that system standard, and I don't like that. No, so the, the stability is the random generated and MAC address to ensure that it comes sure, up on a different IP address. Make sure it's, random, and make sure it's not a, specif a, a compliant MAC so oh, that oh. it gets filtered by every standard router out there. Yeah, absolutely. Enterprise router. Right? Every enterprise. Why would happen if the same device next to it? Perfect. Uh, we should, we should, this would be awesome. We should, this is a good drinking game, right? We should, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and there are some companies out there who, are, who um, I won't mention, but there are some companies out there who, who could really take this advice because, um, you know, they've already built a number of exciting 
iterations of this, but there's more. We could give them more ideas, right? So other things that so you should come do. With a letter of whiskey with each board. <laughs> other things you should do. Uh, well, actually, so the whiskey joke. Um, as, an, as a side note, um, the the Yarm architecture for the longest time. This is a sort of hidden backstory. Um, Arm version 8 was, uh, I guess I can share this now, um, it was known as Oban for the longest time. Because one of the architects um, is a huge whiskey drinker. Uh, well, he enjoys whiskey, he's not a huge whiskey drinker. Um, but and I, in fact, had a glass of Oban with him um, when the architecture became public. Uh, and so we used, to, we used to have these meetings where we'd say, are you involved in whiskey pursuits? With lots of nodding and winking and... Uh, smoke-filled rooms and all that goodness back in the day. Uh, so the other things you should do if you don't want to build a standard server, uh, make sure you use a U-boot, but make sure you use one from many years ago. At least three or four years out of date. 2009 sounds like a good vintage. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Go with 2009. Yep, that's a really good choice. With random backports. With random backports. Random. And preferably have a script that randomizes that. That would be even better. Um, make sure you never update it. Don't ever work with Dennis, who's going to tell you, please include X Linux support and other stuff. Don't ever do that. Or upstream it all. Or upstream yeah, it. And it don't up. upstream it. See, look. Don't, don't do this. Right? Don't upstream it, because that means it might be supportable, and we don't want that. Make sure you don't do that. Um, implement the most beautiful device tree known to man. Describe everything in your hardware. I don't hate device tree. The thing I hate about device tree is it's based on a specification, IEEE 1274. Great. Open firmware, it's based on that. That specifies what the container looks like. It doesn't say what's inside it. To put things in a device tree, you post to LKML. <laughs> Sounds good. Doesn't work for other operating systems, except maybe the BSDs. Others don't care about this because it's not a standard body and they've never worked with it. Um, but that's not even the biggest issue. To change a device tree, you just post to LKML and say, ooh, I realize it should look like this. Let me just send a patch. That's not how you handle standards because that leads to incompatibilities that are crazy, and we've seen many of those. So make sure it's as complicated as possible. Post how you wire it up, upstream that kind of and document it. Then, then change it randomly and incompatibly. Make sure you do that frequently, and for extra credit, force users to upgrade both their firmware and their kernel at the same time. Because I've also seen that one, and that's awesome. There are ARM servers out there today where they are telling people some other operating systems based on Linux, right? Servers. Servers. There are some others out there I've seen where uh, uh, the, op the other operating system companies have told their users, you have to upgrade your U-boot today um, and your kernel uh, and please do them at the same time, because if you don't, your system will fail to boot either side of this. Um, that's not supportable, um, and that can't be done. So make sure you do all these things, and you are guaranteed to have success, but don't talk to me, because uh, I don't want to touch any of that. <laughs> so, uh, why do we care, with Red Hat's hat on for a second? Well, see, we're kind of like the elder statesman in the room with some of this. Um, we're generally harmless. We usually care very much about upstreams, and we look at things like ARM servers and say, oh man, okay, there's a lot of opportunity here, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity for things to go very scarily wrong uh, if we don't help out along the way. Um, so we got involved three years ago with the goal of helping things along uh, and making sure that as some of these things happen, um, they happen in ways that we could support later on uh, if we decide to get commercially involved. Um, in this space, and we also think it's the right thing to do. I think there's nothing cooler than being able to go and buy an ARM server uh, and choose your operating system and expect stuff to just work. That makes this a success. That's what I want. So uh, we got involved about three years ago, a little bit longer. Had a lot of uh, kind of uh, private meetings, I guess, uh, before the stuff got announced publicly. Um, worked on a lot of the specifications and standards and so on. Uh, we continue to do that. Um, and most recently, we announced what we call um, our Partner Early Access Program, uh, which is, um, how should I put it, um, an enterprise-like operating system from us that some people are playing with. Uh, so we as a company are now in the ARM server business. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to see that public commitment from us, because what it means is now we can build on the success we've had 
and we can say, okay, where do we go next? So where do we go next? Um, well, let me actually, sorry, let me first just say a couple of things about why we care. Uh, well, we need a standard platform. Uh, we ship general purpose operating systems. If there are <coughs> choose your own adventure games going on here with 20 different versions, we can't support that. The worst thing possible would be if we then had to get into this space commercially and there were 20 different varieties. That, that doesn't scale, doesn't work for us um, as a business, so we care about cleaning it up. Um, and, you know, we just thought it'd be a really good uh, thing to uh, start to get these commercial companies involved and collaborate with them. Um, we can push these different companies to do things differently from how they might have done it in the embedded space. The reason that um, x86 and PowerPC and other architectures have been very popular and successful um, is these companies involved understand how to work upstream and how to make sure that upstream kernels continue to boot from one release to the next. Um, and we think it'd be great if you could get to a point where every Fedora release with an upstream kernel just worked all the time. No, oh, have you tried RC3 or RC4? It ought to just work every time on every ARM V8 system. That's what I want to see. Benefits to Fedora. First two, and I've got more on the next slide. First two, everybody has to engage upstream. If they're not upstream, we don't ship it, so we can use that as a big stick. We can tell people, you'd like us to support you commercially, that's wonderful. Um, but if you want that, then you're going to have to work upstream. Um, and related to that, we'd like Fedora to be the leading upstream dentist. Quick, quick comment. We work really closely with IBM on Fiat Power and S390, and it work, works really well to help things you know, further along and okay. be much more standard, much, much more productive. And okay. That's the way it should be with the R64. Absolutely, well. absolutely. Because so, I mean, ultimately it provides the best end user experience. So now we have a chance to do this right, okay? We, Red Hat as a company hasn't cared as much about 32-bit ARM or, or you know, ship software or something like this, but now we can bring all of Red Hat's resources to help push things and, and cajole people and motivate them to care and do things that we want in the Fedora space. Uh, so kind of building on that, um, I want to make a couple of points. I thought I'd then boot a system up uh, with X21 uh, while we uh, kind of kick off a general discussion. How long do we have left? Is it until the top of the hour? Pretty much. Pretty yeah? Much. Okay. So uh, there's an opportunity here. Um, I think I've articulated uh, you know, what the opportunity is. Uh, we're in the driving seat this time around. Okay? Other operating systems are coming, and we will see those over time. Um, but we are out in front in terms of defining this and working and, and pushing things in the right directions. We can leverage Red Hat's interests here and Fedora's interests. Um, <laughs> what I'm thinking is, you know, Fedora on server having a having a you know really strong server release um, for 64-bit systems that just works out of the box. I think that would be really really exciting to see. Um, but there are other things too. For example, uh, you know, I, I, we're starting to see a lot of these 64-bit platforms with, well, frankly, both uh, DVD drives and um, graphics cards. Um, and we all know where that goes. Uh, it'd be fun to see things like uh, even no shell running well on 64-bit systems that look a lot like desktop class uh, computers. Oh. On both 32 and 64 bits as well. Well, on 32 bit as well, but but in particular on 64 because you know uh, there's there's a lot of stuff coming. And in terms of low cost hardware, one thing I would add that I, I, I need to be a bit vague on, but there's there's certainly going to be uh, very inexpensive 64 bit hardware within the next year. I'm talking sub $100 price point hardware um, that we can support out of the box. So. You know, while I care very much about 32-bit and long may it continue, uh, there's going to be very, very inexpensive, very compelling 64-bit hardware. I'll believe it when it's shipping. You believe it when it's shipping? I'll believe it when I have one in my hands. Okay. Well, <laughs> exactly. by the time we have next uh, next flock, I was going to say Fudcon, the next flock, uh, that will be the case. Uh, so let's uh, let's have a general discussion here. What do you guys want to see uh, to, uh, to to kind of advance this course? What would really help you? And, and questions as well. Yeah, you've been waiting. Yeah. 
Uh, you mentioned a lot of standards, both hardware standards like AHEI, and I'm particularly involved in the kernel development of the XHEI driver. Right. And uh, lately, I've been getting a lot of bugs because uh, we've been starting to use some of the more advanced XHEI features. Yep. And every implementation has implemented the standard <laughs> differently. Yeah. And Presumably, and that's on x86 as well. Yes, that's that. That is on x86. That's not an ARM. I'm not even touching ARM yet. Right. Um, and all the same, especially also goes for ACPI, and I guess yeah. to a large extent also UEFI. So what I would like to really see is, is a really good compliance suite, mm -hmm. which actually tests the interfaces we use, mm -hmm. and somehow have some carrot or stick for vendors to actually run it before they ship hardware. Yep. Like a certification program or... We I did think that's really important to... So there have been some conversations that, I, I, again, I be a little bit vague about, because these are sort of, you know, not... not Red Hat or Fedora driven activities, but we're involved in them. Um, the, the, the notion of having specifications, compliance suites, certifications, um, tests, all these things have been raised, particularly by me. I'm a big fan of all of those things, and I'm pushing for that. I think we will see that over the next few years. It's a cool walk run strategy, yeah. um, but, but absolutely, absolutely. I'm a huge fan of, of doing all of those things, and I'm pushing for that. Yeah. So. Kind of watch this space, but also I think, you know, there's a sense with which we can make some of this happen for ourselves uh, in the community. So I've been I've been pushing Lenaro to write a, um, you know, firmware compliance suite, for example. Um, I think that's one thing that you know is yeah, we really, really, really need that. Yes. On x86, it's crazy. I I do a lot of kernel support for weird laptops. Yep. And on x86, we have problems like that, for example. This might not even be, be be an opportunity for ARM. That's probably some of these devices will get Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Right, and currently ACPI, neither UEFI, has any specification for uh, radio kill. Yep. And that's such a pain in the x86 world that every vendor invents its own API, firmware API for radio kill. Right, right. Well, one thing I should mention is um, just a backstory there on ACPI. So, three years ago when we started discussing, yeah, like, yeah, three years ago, let's say, when we started discussing ACPI, we identified that there was a, there were multiple operating systems involved. Uh, not just Linux, and uh, all the other reasons why we want to support ACPI. And um, what we said at the time was, ACPI would be great, but if you look at who owns ACPI, it was owned by five companies, um, it wasn't an open standard, and um, it wasn't being updated on a regular cadence. So a few of us got together and had a lot of private meetings, and lawyers got involved, and all kinds of things happened, and that is why ACPI is now part of the UEFI uh, for um, because in the ARM case, we really cared about making sure it was an open specification, an open standard with a standards body behind it, and anybody can join. Okay, there is a membership due to join this forum. It's about $2,000 for people to join and be directly part of the specification. Um, but that's not to say that community members can't give feedback and can't get involved. Um, every single specification, whether it's PCI or anything else, has some kind of body behind it, and it usually costs a little bit of money to directly participate uh, in these specifications. Um, on behalf of Red Hat, though, if you guys have feedback, or anybody in the Fedora community has feedback, we can, of course, funnel that back into these bodies. Um, so, you know, it's, these things are never perfect, um, but it's no worse than any other specification. A lot of work went into cleaning that up. Carlos, did you, you've got a look of uh, no, question uh, on your face. The, the only thing that I have is a as a requirement is a totally brain dead single click. We talked about this in the secondary arches discussion. Single click, vert manager, fire me up an ARC 64 system mm -hmm. with an image and just go because uh, the developer plat developers won't change the platforms they're on, but we're going to want to have for Fedora vert manager full integration to fire up an ARC 64 instance. Or, or like, like I've, or rel, like I've yes. requested for S390 and PBC 64. Yes, yeah, agree. Because there's full system QMUs for them. Someone just has to wire up all the missing pieces to the top level that's of already um, in progress. manager. So, so that's already done. in progress. To have, to have a full uh, system yeah. image moving yeah. with UEFI and doing everything correctly, yeah. both for bare metal or if you kind of, if you have some awareness of Linux being on Linux and that I own other things, yep. that stuff's all being done. Good. So out of the box, click and go. Um, let's boot a system while we uh, talk some more. Yeah, I know because I mean, you know, we were doing this the ad hoc. You run the 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 Kimu system image for ARC sixty four was you know what we're using right now, but 
what we want is something a little slicker to do. So this is um, one of the things Red Hat's been doing with some of these vendors um, is trying to help the UEFI standards along. And one of the ways we do that is we help them fix their firmware bugs on these early platforms. <laughs> because we want UEFI, um, but we want UEFI to work. We want things like Pixie Boot to work. We want it to, be, we want it to be standard compliant. So we're actually going in there with all these vendors and helping them fix things um, and get things working. It'd be nice if you didn't have to do that, <laughs> but it's early days and uh, you know, we're very serious about this. So if uh, things go right, the system's going to boot. I was running with it just now, so it might be, uh, oh, there we go. So this is a UEFI-based boot. It's going to load grub. Here we go. <laughs> so you're <boring. laughs> Are we booting? I think I <laughs> yeah, you saw this movie yesterday, right? Yeah. All right. Well, it's quite possible. While we uh, let me reboot it. Yeah, I probably been, I probably uh, shook the disc loose actually while we were while I was coming over. So let's carry on discussing. Anybody got any other thoughts while I just? Well, I think uh, I think this is this is already perfect time. That standardization for service really works. The boot time is already down to minutes. <laughs> you made the UEFI five load time is down to minutes. I'll take that. Well, you know, the thing is... <laughs> Wait until is, we get Fiber Channel on 10 gig and CNAs and things like that, it'll be at least 20 minutes. The thing is, this is, uh, this is early hardware. These are yeah. early versions of firmware with lots of diagnostics turned on, debug features. Some of the other firmware I've seen will take minutes and minutes because you go through and you see, and you've got the debug output turned on, and you see it saying, loading this, loading this, loading this doing all these other things and you see all the diagnostics coming out and think, oh crap, that's what it's actually doing yeah. while it's sitting here right now. This is a, what they call a release build in UEFI. Um, so you don't see, hmm? well, the tags are beta, but this is, there's two different ways to build UEFI. You can build a development version where it will output all kinds of diagnostic codes right now. It will be going until Kingdom Come. Um, or you can build what's called a release version which doesn't have the output. Um, but um, but the, the, you know, the point here is, yes, UEFI has some complexity, but it's not really UEFI you want to blame. Uh, it's more people who've implemented and made certain choices. So let's see, we try again. Um, if it doesn't boot, then I apologize. I probably shook the system all the way over here. It was booting earlier on today. There we go. Hey. So, and I called it Tilly because um, there was a 1991 uh, movie of um, the little engine that could, uh, and uh, the BBC, I think, decided that, it would be, that the little engine that could's name was finally declared as Tilly. Uh, so my little engine that could is always known as, as Tilly, because um, I'm like that. I named my pinky, pinky part. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a stock Fedora 21 uh, boot. Um, we booted using UEFI, um, and uh, you know, we can show some, you know, you got all this, the stock kind of interfaces. Oh, come on, proxy UEFI is always more accurate. Well, I will show, prop I will show that. Um, you know, so, um, we booted uh, eight cores. There's not a lot of useful output in the uh, in, in CPU info on the R64 yet. That does need cleaning up. I was going to say no neon support. Um, neon's probably the update. So um, the only things that the only things that come up uh, here in features, yeah, are optional features. And in in the server case, um, we actually force you to implement everything. We say you must be VAA compliant. You must do this and this and this and this and this. You have no choice. Um, because we don't want any of this craziness, like, yeah. do you have this, do you have that? Nope. You have precisely no choice, um, because that's how it has to be, if you want a general purpose platform. Some of these guys are like, well, does that mean you're going to force me to do it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, yes, we are. You're going to have to do it right. Um, so what does, that, that, what does that mean for licensees from Arden, then? If they have an architecture license, they can't... You're basically saying, too bad you paid money for the Arch license, and now you can't change any of those parts? 
No, you, you can. can extend it. Okay. You just you have to. You just can't remove anything out of yeah. the. the but I mean, that was no different to RMB5, V6, yeah. V7. There was yeah. minimum yeah. things that yeah. they had to have. Yeah. So like RMB7 had yeah. to have a floating point unit, where prior yeah. to that it was optional. Yeah. So we didn't give we don't give people a choice about things like you know floating point or other stuff that you take for granted of any other system out there today. Yeah. Um, crypto is one thing that we do allow flexibility in mm -hmm. because for export compliance reasons. Yeah. Some people can't implement crypto extensions. Yeah. Um, you had a question? Uh, very, very simple question, um, looking at it from the outside. So as a server manufacturer or server designer or etc., uh, are there any kinds of compliance testing rules, certifications uh, that I can follow or must follow? Um, so will there be some sort of marketing badge that says uh, this is a certified ARM server platform or blah, etc. Just to get awareness in the market because right now I could imagine a lot of, of smaller companies designing whatever, putting it out in the market saying yeah. this is an ARM server. Yeah. So is there any plans to protect the term ARM server or certified ARM thing. environment or whatever? Yeah, there, is, there, are, there are plans to, to yeah. impose various protections. I yeah. think the first thing is We've been fortunate so far that everybody who's building an ARM server is at least talking to me uh, on this end and is also talking to, more importantly, these organizations that have names that, um, well, there's, there is, there is, shall we say, there is, there is a group that works on ARM server specifications. Um, so that's the SBSA, right? Yes, the so group behind it, that. Is there going to be requirements for an ARM server to be SBSA compliant? Yes. So, so what, for what, them to claim to be an ARM server, they have to have gone le through. Legally, no, but I mean, as far as as far as reality goes, all the operating system companies commercially, so Red Hat has publicly said, we will not support any ARM server, and we've told all these companies for years, mm -hmm. we won't support any ARM server that doesn't uh, comply with SPSA, doesn't boot using UEFI, doesn't use ACPI. If you use device tree to boot your system, we won't support you. This system does contain a device tree because it's a bring up system. And we're in a process internally of migrating some of these over to a stock ACPI. There have been a lot of moving pieces to get ACPI 5.1 up and running. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a transition in progress. But everybody who's building hardware now uh, is, building, uh, is building hardware that way. Some of the early stuff is transitioning over because um, they made some choices early on and had to go and get fixed. But, um, but basically, everybody has told them commercially, and not just Linux folks, but some other folks too, have, have, have said, you know, you have to do things a certain way. Um, and I think that's a big stick to you. But this, this, this compliance stuff is a sort of self certification of the vendor itself. So he says, I'm implementing this the right way. There's no external level of certification or certification standards. So, so, so for SPSA, so for, for, for all the different um, um, server chips that are being built, um, what's happened for the overwhelming majority of them, I've sat down personally with the design team and gone over the chip design mm. and reviewed it and made sure that it's SPSA compliant. Mm. To my satisfaction, I don't scale. We're working on that. Um, <laughs> not through a cloning, <laughs> not through a cloning program. Believe me, that's better for everybody if there's only one of me. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, but um, but but there are you know so far we've been lucky that, that a whole bunch of us have sat down. I think what will happen is uh, there'll be one or two companies that are very very clearly you know market leaders. People will look at it and say, okay, that's a good gold reference for how to build a server. You know, hopefully there'll be friends at Campion who are here in the room. Right? Hopefully you guys are you know people say, oh, that's how to build a server. Okay, so if it doesn't. If it works on that, doesn't work on mine, then I've done something wrong, right? So I think I think what will happen is the standard sort of industry competition will uh, will push people to have one or two really, you know, probably three or four really strong players. Everybody else will kind of say, ah, oh, man, mine isn't working like this other guy, so I've done something wrong. So it's a little bit of a self-certifying thing. So there is like some. Like x86, then. It, it will be a lot like x86 in that sense. But there will also be um, there will also be. Uh, you know, increasingly, I think some compliance suites and other things that appear. Anybody got anything else before we wrap up? Uh, one more. Yes. So, how do these vendors then, um, like in the past, they differentiated themselves yep. and had value adds by yep. doing really crazy stuff in their SOCs? So how do you do value add? Very quick answer to that. Yeah. There's no value. In fact, there's negative, gratuitous differentiating value in. <laughs> that's a. Double negative. Anyway, there is a gratuitous differentiation when you try to do so on how you boot your system right. or the UART. There is no value 
In fact, what ARM did as part of the SPSA, we specify the PL11 UART, we specify a subset of it, and I think there's even, I won't go into the details, but it's, a, it's, it's extremely affordable for people building chips to include that in their chip, put it that way, right? So there's no value in doing that differently. However, if you've got a cryptographic offload engine or you've got some network accelerator, go knock yourself out. That's where you can differentiate. Don't differentiate how you boot your system or find your hard disk. There's no value in that. So just differentiation will come with things like IPMI management right. and all that other stuff, yeah. you know, like integrating. Yeah. You know, and performance and server room management. The and specification. All that yeah. Good stuff. So if anybody wants to play with a, 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 system, a hardware system, uh, we can do so later. Yeah, he's going to speak with an ARM hack fest later. Trick, trick one. Which ARM server? I mentioned your name, yes. There's one right here. Which one? 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 Which